So you may be wondering why I'm sitting on the toilet. Well, today's video is sponsored by Broday. Broday is a bidet that is easy to install, cleans your butt in seconds, and you never have to worry about toilet paper or skid marks again. Now, this has been especially helpful since I do have Crohn's, and let's admit, nobody likes a sloppy bottom. So click the link in the description and you can figure out more about Broday. And also there's a $10 off discount that's happening right now. So make sure to buy Broday. Your bottoms will thank you. You know, I can hear the cackling from down the street because she was introduced to many of us on season <laughs> five of RuPaul's Drag Race where she took home the crown. She's wowed us with her impressive voice, not only on Drag Race, but also in her group, The Vaudevillians. And she has a brand new holiday comedy show out right now mm -hmm. called The Jinx and De La Holiday Special with Ben De La Creme. Her name is Jinx Monsoon and she's about to be exposed. Hey, hey, Jinx. Hi there. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm feeling so exposed right now. You know, I always say when a drag queen looks like she's naked, um, she's still wearing like six layers of clothing. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, let's do a little deep dive into your life. Now, little Jinx, you were born and raised in Portland, Oregon, right? Yes. What were you like when you were a little kid? Oh, pretty much just like this. Um, <laughs> I I was always extremely femme um, from basically the womb on. And, um, you know, I was the kind of little child that had um, Barbie dolls. And I was obsessed with one redheaded Barbie doll. And um, when her head broke off, um, I just carried around the head because it was the red hair that I was concerned with, not the rest of the doll. I've been obsessed with red hair since I was a child. Um, I, I was fairly nerdy throughout school, and this kind of made me feel a lot like an outcast at many times. Like, I, I had friends. It's not like I was a complete loner, but um, I did keep to myself a lot of the time. And um, I used this time to study classical music and Greek mythology, which only further separated me from my from my peers. And I really didn't um, start to feel I really didn't start to feel real connections with other people um, my age until I came out. And it was like when I stopped trying to present some idea that wasn't true for me. Like when I stopped trying to be a boy, um, when I stopped trying to act straight, which I never did successfully, um, I feel like I connected with people much better because they were, you know, getting to know the real me and I was getting to be the real me. So, um, you know, I was, I was a studious child, <laughs> a studious child and teenager and um, endlessly flamboyant. <laughs> well, the thing that I think is pretty cool is that you started drag at such an early age because what, you were what, 15 at the time and you were at Escape Nightclub and performing and your grandma was taking you to shows? Like, how, how did that come to be? How did the drag persona come to be that you were like at 15, you know what, I want to dress up and I want to do drag? There's so many elements to this story, and I'll try to stick to the main points. But um, so I think the biggest thing is that I was born and raised um, in Portland, Oregon. And, um, you know, Portland is just a very queer place in general. <laughs> and um, I came out at like 13 or 14 and I started going to the Sexual Minority Youth Resource Center or SMIRC, um, which was a, a resource center and, and queer teen hangout spot. And I spent like so many days after school hanging out there, getting to know other people my own age who were also queer and also trans. And um, that kind of just opened the floodgates for me. I saw a drag show there and the drag queen, um, 
uh, Abby, I'm, I'm blanking on her last name right now, but her name was Abby. And she pointed directly to me in the audience in the middle of the song. And I can't remember the song, but she pointed directly in into my soul and looked me dead in the eyes. And I swear the next weekend I was doing drag and <laughs> it was like she passed it on to me. And um, my grandma never took me to the nightclubs, um, but she would, um, you know, I, I would stay at my grandma's for the weekend and my mom would think I was just having a weekend at home with Nana and what I was really doing was getting into full drag and I would check in with my grandma before I left and she would give me her final thoughts on on my look and then oftentimes I rode my bike down to the club which if my grandma knew I was doing that I would have gotten in big trouble but I would get into full drag ride my bike to the club and then um, throw my bike in the back of my friend's pickup truck and go back to my grandma's at like 4 a.m. And I always had to wake her up and let her know I got home. And she was never worried about me because I was such a good two shoes. You know, I didn't drink or experiment with drugs at all in high school. The one and only thing I was doing that was out of the norm um, was, you know, being a drag queen. <laughs> <laughs> and riding your bike down the street as, as in drag. And I never got sick of when I would pull up to the club and all the people in line waiting to get into the club, you know, of course, in unison, we're all da -da 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 every time. I never got sick of it. <laughs> <laughs> so you end up taking um, your drag to stage. You were doing the Bacon Strips show and you were getting a little bit of a different type of experience of drag. You end up having a lot of different um, improv-esque type things, and it's not just straight drag with lip syncing. <laughs> what did that show teach you about drag? So um, Bacon Strip was this um, monthly drag show presented by Sylvia O. Stay for More. And this is in Seattle. So this is many years later, um, after high school, after college. I think right after I graduated, I, I started performing in Bacon Strip. And what I loved about it is that Sylvia O. Stay for More would assemble this cast of kind of like the misfits of drag, I mean, plenty of gorgeous, stunning drag creatures, but a lot of people who kind of went against the grain, who um, who were less interested in doing top 40s and, you know, um, pop hits and more interested in creating like drag vaudeville acts is the only way to <laughs> Every month she would pick a different theme and we would all have to construct a number that fit that theme. And what I loved about that is that, A, that was the kind of shows I was putting on in Portland as a teenager. Um, and so it felt really at home with me. But the theme she would pick would be so different from anything I would have picked for myself that it challenged me every month. Like, OK, so if we're going to do Space Pirates, how does Jinx Monsoon fit into Space Pirates, you know? And um, I oftentimes enlisted the help of my fellow actors from my art school. And um, I oftentimes uh, did impersonations. This is where I kind of like um, honed in on my uh, the impersonations I like to do. Like for Studio 54, I did Little Edie for the first time. And this is at like age 22. Um, and I had just discovered Little Edie, so I was itching for a chance to perform as her. And I decided, you know, I bet she went to Studio 54. She should be here, you know? Looking at those experiences and also you're very good with impersonations, you're very good with your acting chops. Um, what is it about old school legends that you love? Um, besides the fact that they're, um, you know, I don't know. I think my favorite old school legends are the icons that have like so much glamour so much effervescence, so much like um, 
that je ne sais quoi, um, but also have some sort of tragic backstory. You know, I'm addicted to um, old Hollywood legends who presented as really glamorous and perfect, but behind the scenes had some pain and trauma and um, tragedy that they were dealing with. And I think that's what I really like about my drag work is Drag has always been my way to deal with traumatic aspects of my life in a comical way. So I present this veneer of like this glamorous old Hollywood uh, drunken MILF, um, but it comes from a place of, you know, um, having somewhat of a tumultuous childhood, um, having a lot of uh, issues that I deal with in regards to mental health and uh, I'll just say it, addiction. <laughs> it's kind of like... Um, it's kind of like this uh, this outlet for me. I always say that Jinx allows me to deal with my demons on stage so that I don't carry them around with me in my day to day life. Like I feel like I'm able to be the kind of grounded, mindful, um, loving, generous person that I am in my day to day life. God, that sounds conceited. But I'm able to be that because Jinx is where I put all my darkest evil aspects of myself and just contain them within this. <laughs> it's like it's like your little therapy session. You don't even have to see a therapist. Yeah, it is. I always try to I, I only I only do stuff on stage that I've already worked through in my own life because I uh, in acting school we were told like you shouldn't be experiencing the trauma in real time on stage. Like you can comment on the trauma, you can use the trauma as like um, something to inspire your work. But if you're working through it on stage, you're basically asking an audience to be your therapist and that's not what the audience is there for. So yeah, it is a form of therapy and it's also a form of like showing what I've learned. You know, like it's a form of, um, okay, so now I've worked on this with myself and um, with my, my close confidants and with my therapist and now I'm ready to share it with the world, share what I've learned about this, you know, <laughs> I <laughs> whatever love this may be. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in the year of 2012, in November, you're announced as a cast member on season five of just a little baby television show nobody knows about called RuPaul's <laughs> Drag Race. Um, where were you when you got the phone call? Oh, I was at my apartment in Seattle. And it was a really interesting week because... Um, I sent in my, I, I, I sent in my audition for drag race and, you know, there's a lot of steps after you audition, there's a lot of steps before they finally choose you. So I had done the psych evaluation <laughs> and, um, <laughs> that was one of the most nerve wracking things of my life. Cause I was like, it's all going to come to the surface. Um, <laughs> but, um, I, uh, I, you know, I was trying my best to kind of just go on with life while I was also preparing myself mentally and costume wise for the potential um, casting on Drag Race. So I was still going about my business. And the same week that I found out about Drag Race, I also found out I was cast in the Seattle's musical theater, um, the Fifth Avenue Theater's production of Rent. And as an actor in Seattle, the Fifth Avenue Theater for musical actors is where you want to be because so many shows preview there before they go to New York. Um, Aladdin previewed there. And then some of the Seattle actors got to go to um, Broadway with the um, first production of Aladdin. So when I found out I was cast in these two things at the same time, I really had this like scary decision to make because if I, if I pull out of this play, it might be shooting myself in the foot for my acting career in Seattle and my potential acting career at all. Um, but if I turned down drag race, I could be missing out on one of the biggest opportunities in my life. Luckily, through some sweet talking and through some, you know, clever, clever chess playing on my part, um, I was able to do both. <laughs> and, um, and, and the rest is all on TV. So, <laughs> 
Well, speaking of the TV aspect, you walk through the workroom. It's the first day. <laughs> you know, I can hear the cackling from down the street. Did you anticipate, judging from your competition in that moment, that you were going to be in the finale? I will say that I tried my best to go into Drag Race a realist, and I tried to maintain just, you know, real expectations throughout the throughout the whole process. Because, you know, I think there were 14 queens on my season. One in 14 is an, a huge chance, you know, <laughs> especially when it's a competition. Um, uh, so I, I really just went on the show thinking, as long as I make it to Snatch Game, as long as I get to play Little Eden, on television everything after that will just be gravy on top um that's so gross <laughs> <laughs> just pouring gravy all over me um i i really did just go on hoping to make it to snatch game and and I said to myself, if I do that, I will feel a success. I will feel happy with everything. And I remember my friends who, you know, I, I didn't tell my friends where I was going because I wasn't legally allowed to. But everyone, you know, they see a drag queen packing for five weeks and <laughs> and they they can figure it out. Um, so all of my friends, um, my closest friends basically told me, you've got to realize that there's no reason you won't go to the top three. and I pushed all of that out of my head because I thought if I went in with that expectation, I'd be so much more disappointed than if I just went in hoping to make it to snatch game. Cause I, I felt fairly confident I could do that. Um, it wasn't until, um, I think it was top five, um, with our veterans and doing the makeover with my veteran Dave, um, that that was when I decided, okay, enough of this, you know, playing it wise enough of this, like, uh, <laughs> saving, saving my heart from disappointment. I'm going for it. I'm going to win this thing. And that was the moment. And it was Dave saying it to me at one point, like when I didn't get eliminated that episode, that's all either Dave and I wanted. Neither of us really thought, okay, we're going to win this challenge. <laughs> we were just really happy to do well and, and to present the, the characters we had both felt passionate about. And then when we made it on to the next episode, Dave just looked me dead in the eyes and said, okay, Jinx, now you have to go win this. And I said, all right, Dave, I'm going to. And that was the moment. That was the moment I became bloodthirsty. <laughs> wow. Well, one thing is that there are compilations of one of your phrases that you have said multiple times on Drag Race and throughout history of water <laughs> off a duck's back. Water off a duck's back. Next up, Jinx Monsoon. Now, let me ask you a question yeah. because I had heard that that came from fellow Seattle drag queen Robbie Turner. Is that true? Yes. Um, so... Robbie was the one who dropped me off at the airport when I went um, to film Drag Race. And it was like my second time ever flying in my life. Um, and uh, I was, you know, very, very nervous. I was like a bundle of nerves about going into a competition because um, without being too like sappy or poor me about it, um, I had kind of had a lot of experiences where other drag queens treated me like I, you know, didn't belong there. And I think a big part of this is um, just the aesthetics. You know, I was like intentionally kind of scrappy. It was my MO to look a little rough around the edges. I thought that's what served my character the best. Um, and so a lot of queens would just take one look at me, you know, my kind of antiquated styling or my crazy makeup and my frizzy red wigs and just kind of think next, you know, that filled me with a lot of anxiety going into a, a competition for the top drag queens of the U.S., you know. And Robbie um, knew this about me. And um, I had told everyone I was going with my aunt to a nature retreat. Um, and <laughs> so even though that we all knew what I was talking about, Robbie, you know, again, a person looked me in the eyes and Robbie said, at your nature retreat, 
<laughs> um, if people are giving you a hard time and starting to get in your head, just say water off a duck's back. Now, I wish I would have said it like a hundred less times <laughs> because I am. Um, I do watch it now and I'm like, whoa, you look crazy, lady. But what I'll say about that is that I needed it. I, I needed it. I needed that like that mantra or as I now refer to it, the spell I was casting on myself. And I remember um, having a hard time seeing some fans kind of criticizing me about having a mantra and having to kind of build up my self-esteem throughout throughout the the process of drag race, you know, saying like a true winner wouldn't need to build herself up or a true winner wouldn't be insecure. She just knows she's the best. And it's like, no. okay, first of all, a winner can be anyone. A winner can be anyone with struggling with all kinds of things. That's first of all. Second of all, um, I will not feel ashamed or um, shamed for the fact that I know what I need in life and I, and I'm willing to give it to myself, you know, <laughs> that sounds very masturbatory, but like, if I, if I knew I needed the pep talk and I gave it to myself and I didn't make it anyone else's problem, but my own, like, what are you complaining about? Like uh, the whole idea that a winner has to be this or that, or a winner can't be something else. I, I let that get into my head for a while after I won, and I really thought maybe they have a point. And now, eight years later, it only took eight years, but I'm really, <laughs> I'm really resolved in the fact that like I did win, and I am who I am. So these people criticizing me for having vulnerability, I think their rhetoric's kind of flawed, you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, let me ask you because a lot of fans ask this: um, Do you? I know that you, the water up ducks back came from Robbie Turner. Do we know if he is doing okay or have you talked to him? The last time I checked in with Robbie, um, she said she was doing well and haven't um, heard from Robbie in a long time. And it's one of those, it's one of those difficult things where it's like um, we were really close friends for a long time. And when you go on tour as your job and spend a lot of time away from everyone, um, it's difficult to maintain friendship. So our, our friendship we had already kind of like had its struggles before, you know, but we still checked in with each other regularly. And then um, after, you know, the the media blitz um, mm-hmm. having to do with Robbie Turner, like, do I give this person space? Do I check in with them continually? And since the last time I checked in with them, they just said they were doing well and kind of just needed their own time. I just tried to respect that. Um, as far as I know, she's doing well or doing all right. But I also, you know, don't don't trust me as the um, the source of information on this. <laughs> well, back to season five, you are starting to show the world your looks, your acting chops. And of course, we cannot forget delusion. Delusion. <laughs> Convince yourself. <laughs> Would you ever actually put forth the delusion fragrance and give it the proper ad campaign? I guess so. It's not like it's not like I have any anything against doing that. I've just always been way more interested in performing than being um, being any kind of merchandise mogul. Um, and I, you know, I think like there's definitely things I could put out there that I would feel really good about putting out into the world and really good about putting my name on them. And those things are generally like edibles. Um, (laughs) um, I, I, I'd love to, uh, well, you know, I try to, I try to keep up with having new merchandise and I always try to make sure that the merchandise is flattering for any gender presentations. Um, I try to take into account, um, what my, what the feedback is. So, you know, um, and that's about as far as I've gotten, you know, (laughs) um, I think a perfume or like a fragrance is kind of like venturing into this realm that I've never really been interested in venturing into. So I guess it's one of those things where if I could find the right 
people to everything to, and then just show up to do the ad campaign. <laughs> Uh, maybe I maybe I'd consider it. Um, so if you can put me in touch with like um, Givenchy or uh, <laughs> Dior, I'll, I'll I like their to, to their sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you you said you love the performance aspect, the best of everything, and we clearly saw that in Snatch Game when you played Little Edie. It was in all the magazines at the time. <laughs> Now, when I had watched your documentary, Drag Becomes Him, you said that Little Edie and your impersonations and stuff came from when you were high. Um, so yeah. my question to you is, does a lot of the creativity that you um, end up coming up with in your impersonations, does that spin out of like a good high? I would say when I was younger, yes. Um, when I was younger, uh, I would get stoned much more frequently and uh, a much deeper stoned than I get these days. Um, there was a shift in my life where I kind of stopped using um, marijuana medicine. Uh, no, I stopped using it recreationally and started using it for its health benefits, um, uh, namely for anxiety, depression. And it actually also helps tons with my symptoms of narcolepsy. And I'll say that like when I was using it re recreationally, I don't think it necessarily had these benefits for me. It's kind of like when you use it for health benefits or for medicinal purposes, you kind of have to go into it consciously using it for that reason. You know, like you have to decide when's the best time to use it, how much, learn which strains work best with you. It becomes much more of a conscious cerebral thing than just getting stoned with your friends, which I still do on occasion. Um, but I, I'm 33 now and a lot of my body chemistry's changed. And so my relationship to weed has changed. But I will say like weed does kind of spark interest in things that I normally wouldn't find interesting. And then I revisit them later when I'm sober and um, um, find out if they're actually worth digging into <laughs> or if they were just a stone delusion, you know? <laughs> <laughs> See, there you go. Stone delusion. We can just go straight into a blunt now. That's, that's it. <laughs> That'll be the more musky or more masculine scent. And then just plain old delusion will be for, for everyone. <laughs> I love it. Well, you end up getting to episode 11. It is the sugar ball. You end up in the bottom two with Miss Detox for the first time. And I <laughs> spoke to Detox a few months ago, and she told mm -hmm. me that the lip sync had changed from Free Your Mind to Malambo number one because she said that the producers had heard you singing and wailing this song. And there was this one bitch that was singing the whole time, like screaming, and it was Jinx singing that song. <laughs> so when they switched it at the last minute, I was like, I'm gonna go ahead and pack, even though I already knew I was not gonna be making it to the final three. Is that true? So I'm not a producer, so I can neither confirm nor deny that that's why the song was changed. Um, but I can confirm the song was changed. Um, and that happens multiple times throughout Drag Race. Like it's happened multiple times. It wasn't like this is the first time it had happened. Usually it's a music licensing issue. Now, was Malambo number one the song that I said I would send anyone home with? Yes. <laughs> like, if you want to go digging around for conspiracy theory, yes, I was constantly singing and wailing this song. Detox is not a liar. Um, the only thing I can't attest to is um, if that had anything to do with the song change. You know, I I I just counted my blessings. But I really want to... Um, I just want to say for all those conspiracy theorists out there who um, want to believe that the producers stacked this in my favor, like I said, I can neither confirm nor deny that. Um, but what I can say is if the song had been Free Your Mind by In Vogue, I still would have sent Detox home. I was determined. I was determined to win that lip sync, whatever the song was. It could have been. Um, it could have been True Colors. It could have been The Seven Wonders. It could have been um, uh, something by Run DMC. I don't care what the song was. I was so convicted 
I would have sent her home with any song. And I love Detox dearly. And she, she's she been a really, really good friend to me um, since we stopped being in competition together. <laughs> but so this is no shade to Detox. This is just to say how convicted and how determined I was to make it to the top three. And who knows? There could have been a song that she could have sent me home with. But I'm pretty confident that no matter what the song was, the outcome would have been the same. <laughs> exactly. And you, you kill so it. Bad, that, <laughs> that Malambo number one went down. I remember watching it and I was like, Oh my gosh, this is like the, the everything that you were giving me was what needed to be done. You make it to the final. Now, let me ask you a question. You guys film the final, you film each one of Queens like winning, you know, so you had done it. And then, you end up, what, you're at a nightclub, is that correct? And you're in the back, and you're sitting on a couch, and that's kind of when you watch it. Now, I had talked to Alaska last year, and we re-watched together the video of her throwing a fit and crying. Now, yeah. let, let <laughs> me ask you, did that detract away from your win? Um, no, I didn't think it detracted from my win. Um, I... I, I don't think it really hit me that I won for a while until like my, it's kind of one of those things where um, where I prepared so heavily for both outcomes that then I kind of had a hard time realizing one outcome happened over the other one. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think I think what it was is that I won and then there was not a lot of time to celebrate. You know, I won. Then we had to get ready to go do our numbers. Then the next day I had to get up at 6 a.m. and um, go to a press junket. And so we, even at the press junket, I'm spending all day talking about how I won. And it's still not really hitting me that I actually won. It was kind of just like I was going through the motions of winning, but not taking any time to process that I had won. So that didn't really sink in for a while. You know what? It didn't really. I think the moment I realized I won, I did that. That happened was the night that I crowned Bianca. It was like once it was out of my hands, then I really stopped and reflected on how how monumental it was that I won. Um, I didn't take any moment uh, for granted the year after Drag Race because I was so appreciative of all the things I got to do and all the opportunities that opened up for me after my time on Drag Race. So, um, but that also plays into the fact that I kind of just kept working. I kept, you know, I, I said, okay, I won. And now what am I going to do next? And how am I going to, um, how am I going to use this opportunity uh, to, to foster new opportunities? And how am I going to use this platform to be the advocate I always wanted to be? And and I don't think I really gave myself a moment to stop working. I just kind of plowed through. <laughs> Looking at that, though, you do end up working. And this was, I think, season four and season five were the first seasons that kind of had the turning point to where the girls started touring after and you guys started doing the bots tour and you started doing all of that type of stuff. And then you had your own show you took on the road with the vaudevillians and stuff. Like how was that experience going from before drag race to after drag race? Like was, was there a humongous difference in fans and show vibes and all of that? Oh yeah. It was like, um, when we were doing it before drag race, we were doing it for audiences of 12, audiences of two. We were doing it for free in a Starbucks in the middle of the day. Um, you can go to Ben de la Creme for that story. Um, <laughs> you know, we were passionate about doing it, but um, we were the only ones. And, <laughs> and then post Drag Race, not only did we, you know, find a lot of people who are drag fans and fans of musical theater and fans of esoteric comedy, um, but we also found out that our fan base who were coming to see me just because they had seen me on Drag Race were now learning that they actually really love drag cabaret and musical theater and stuff. You know, they come expecting tongue pops and top forties and they leave singing ragtime and, <laughs> and, and doing the 22 skidoo, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, that's such the cool thing about your drag aesthetic is that you're bringing on a totally different thing. You have a character, you have all this going for you. You can sing, you put on a full, theatrical type show 
Considering how heavy your drag incorporates live theater performance, how has the pandemic and everything changed your creative mind? Oh, in every way. <laughs> that's it. That's that that sums it up. I mean, everything's changed. And it's been it's been a challenge. It's been a wonderful challenge because yeah, what I'll say is like immediately, um, as soon as all my gigs disappeared and, and, and that's really how it felt. I had my year booked. Um, uh, 2020 was going to be my year, you know, I, I uh, <laughs> starting 2020, um, with, uh, my boyfriend, um, I, you know, for the first time in years, I was in, um, a wonderful, supportive, loving relationship. Um, I, I had moved into my house in Portland, Oregon, which I bought to be closer to my blood family. I, I had all these wonderful things on the docket for, for 2020, you know, shows with Peaches Christ and Ben La Creme and Major Scales and, I was, you know, I had it, I had it all worked out and then the pandemic hit and everything just went, it was like every day there was a new email telling me that my gigs got canceled, which I I was, you know, I had, I think an appropriate amount of disappointment, but I also was like, what else can you do? Like, I'm not going to put myself or audiences at risk by trying to do something in a time when it's just not wise to do so. And then, of course, a week later, we didn't even have the option. You know, it was now illegal to do it all. So, <laughs> so I I very briefly licked my wounds. And then my best friend, Kenny, who's been my assistant since Drag Race, he's been my tour manager um, for many of my productions. Um, he and I just kind of said, OK, well, there go all the gigs. So what are we going to do now? And we just very quickly set up um, a performance space in my house. We very quickly set up my cameo. We just like um, shifted gears without much time to really like feel sorry for ourselves. And um, so now I'm launching a Patreon and that's like providing a creative outlet for me. It's providing some work for all the people on my team. And uh, it, hopefully it'll just, you know, keep me in everyone's minds as we continue to twiddle our thumbs waiting for uh, the apocalypse to be over. <laughs> I bet you're lurking around my house trying to find out what I have going on over at my brand new Patreon page. What can people expect from the Patreon? Like what's to come of that? Is it shows? Is it numbers? Like what? It, what's to come from that? Uh, yeah, I'm doing tons of things, a, a variety of things on my Patreon. Um, I'm writing sketches um, with my comedy partner, Nick Sahoya, um, and uh, with my videographer, Liam Krug, um, who's this wonderful young uh, video artist who brings a sense of um, relevance and <laughs> uh, pop culture that I'm completely out of touch with into the work I'm creating now. So he's a lot of fun to collaborate with. Um, so I'm, I, I'm doing like sketches. We're doing um, interviews with people from my life. Uh, I'm doing a podcast with Nick Sahoya called I'm 40% Podcast. And it's a Futurama review podcast because it's our favorite show. One of our favorite shows. I say, this is my favorite show about everything. Um I'm I'm doing music with my partner. Um, we're just doing, you know, little covers of songs and making little music videos in my living room that we think are cute. And uh, let's see, did I hit everything? Uh... <laughs> So lots of stuff. It's going to be a variety of things. And and if you subscribe to the Patreon, you get to see it all first. Um, You get to see it exclusively there um, for quite some time until I start, you know, leaking it out of places. But uh, you get it first when you subscribe to my Patreon. (laughs) Ow, ow. We'll have a link to that down in the description. Um, you were speaking just now about a podcast in your one of your favorite shows being Futurama. I know another one of your favorite shows, Steven Universe, you got to do a little voice acting. I won't destroy my beautiful ship, but I will make it so you can't get away. Aim for their Nova thrusters. How, yeah. how was that experience for you? 
Oh, it was really surreal because I don't subscribe to any organized religion, um, and I'm I'm pretty uh, uh I'm pretty loud mouthed about that. Um, but uh, if I did have a religion, it would be Steven Universe. Uh, <laughs> so when I got really into that show. You know, I just it was the first time I ever felt like I bet if I put it out into the universe, um, it might happen. And I I was really excited when when Rebecca Sugar did um, call me and I went to the Cartoon Network studios to record my episode. And Rebecca Sugar was there to uh, to greet me and give me a tour and tell me about my character. And um, she gave me, you know, helpful hints for my my first big voice acting job. Um, you know, I was like, I basically apologized to her for spamming her on the Internet. Um, <laughs> I was like, um, I really appreciate this, but also I'm so sorry if like <laughs> I was obnoxious by like poking you on the internet saying like, Hey, if you ever think about casting me sometimes. And, um, the sweetest thing she said was that, um, uh, that, uh, I, I said she, and I don't know that uh, I don't know, um, their pronouns. So I'm going to say they until I know, <laughs> let me text. Rebecca right now. Um, so the sweetest thing that Rebecca said um, to me is um, that they had seen my first little comment about it on the internet. And two years later, there was finally a role that they thought was perfect for me. So they had basically kind of um, Rebecca and the other writers and um, people who worked on the show had decided early on, they wanted to offer me a role, but they weren't just going to shoehorn me into a role. They were going to wait until there was a role that said Jinx Monsoon. So little did I know for the two years that I'm like, you know, casting spells and and, you know, lighting candles, hoping to get on the show. Um, they already had full plans for, um, for, for putting me on. And when Emerald came around, I'm so, I'm so grateful because I really loved voicing Emerald. I really love playing villains whenever I get a chance. And, um, and I told that to Rebecca, I'm like, I'm excited to play a villain. And Rebecca said something that I've taken with me into my life since that experience. But, um, Rebecca said, um, there are no evil gems, just gems who haven't learned how to be good yet. <laughs> I like and, that. And, and that's, yeah, that's a, that's a mantra I've taken in, into my life. If you don't know, I'm a big fan of mantras. <laughs> if you haven't heard anything about that. <laughs> That must have been one of the coolest things to like actually see the episode completion, like, you know, and just see where it ended up going from there. Um, so I, I want to get into a little um, topic before we get into the amazing holiday special. Um, in <laughs> April of 2017, you were on Hey Queen and you said the following. I never identified fully male. I always identified more gender fluid or gender ambiguous you know mm. so my question to you is that i think a lot of times especially in the gay community or those that are outside of the lgbt community when people say words like non-gendered or non-binary people get a little bit confused or people may not know what that means so for you what does the word non-binary mean um so I had never known how to describe my gender identity because I knew that I didn't have any desire to change my my body or myself to be female. Yet, I've always known that I identify more as female. And the only way I can explain it is that I feel like I have a feminine spirit inside of me. I have a feminine energy and a feminine self that is my true self. And at the same time, I feel very comfortable in the body that I'm in. You know, um, when I felt uncomfortable in life, it was when I thought that I had to present as male because of my genitalia. You know, I, I also have been a drag queen since I was 15. So there is this kind of thought like, I'll keep my femininity to my drag. And then out of drag, everyone expects me to be a boy. So that's what I'll be. Um, there was also a, a, a large amount of stigma about being a femme presenting boy 
uh, a femme presenting perceived male at birth person um, when you want to date people in the queer community, you know, um, the, that stigma still exists, but I think it's definitely lessened over the years. Um, and I think we're, we're, you know, changing our collective point of view on gender identities and gender expression. But it used to be that to be femme presenting may meant that a lot of guys would not have even considered having interest in me um, because they had already decided they were mask for mask or however you want to describe it. So when I heard non-binary, when I heard gender non-conforming, gender fluid, these were all words that really resonated with me. And I was like, oh, finally, there's a way to describe how I feel. And, you know, there were early iterations of these terms, but they just didn't speak to me the way that the terms we're using now did. And um, so so now I very plainly identify as um, a trans femme non-binary individual. And uh, I got to say that stigma I was talking about, what I found in my own life, and this is not to generalize anyone else's experience, but in my own life, when I embraced my true self, my true gender identity, when I started living my truth, I started meeting people who were attracted to me because I was living my truth, because I was being authentic. And my experiences improved when I stopped meeting people under the guise that I was you know, a boy and trying to present as a boy because it was so inauthentic for me. And it's hard to maintain a form and a presentation that's inauthentic to, for you. You know, it was exhausting. It was, um, you know, it didn't make me feel great. And I'll say the sex wasn't amazing because I was like trying to act mask in the bedroom <laughs> And sex is so much better when you get to be yourself during it. So, um, so yeah, when I, when I came out as gender non-binary, you know, it's not like, it, it's not like there haven't been tumultuous moments. It's not like there, I haven't faced backlash both, um, from all directions, you know, I've, I, I've faced a, my fair share of intolerance and, um, skepticism, criticism, but all of it's like kind of whatever, because the quality of life when you're, when you're living your truth and being authentic to yourself is worth the hardships. And, and that's why I really have been so vocal about my experiences to put that out into the world for other people to learn from and for other people who feel similarly to me to know that they're not alone and that there's nothing weird about what they're feeling. <laughs> I'm so glad that you described it in that way, because I, I think that especially, you know, in our LGBTQIA plus community, there are things that not everybody in the community understands. And then there's some people that don't want to, you know, open a book or look at the internet, but just being able to hear another experience that anybody can relate to is like literally chef's kiss. Because when you hear that one person's experience and if you can relate, that helps you in your journey as well. So thank you so much for elaborating on that. Cause I think that that's going to be helpful for a lot of people. Yeah. I think there's, I think all around the world, all types of people within and outside of the LGBTQ plus community, there are just a lot of people who say the phrase like, when's enough going to be enough? You know, I remember seeing like people on British television saying like, I understand gay, I understand queer, I understand trans, but non-binary, now you're asking for too much. And it's like, first of all, no, we're not. Because we're not asking you to do anything differently, but just continue to have respect for other people. And second of all, like, where is the mentality coming from that we're going to reach a point where people are going to stop making discoveries or that, you know, or things are going to stop evolving? You know, like, how, how outraged would we be right now if someone told a woman, like, you know, like, you got your right to vote 
that's enough, you know, <laughs> you know, like we wouldn't accept that. So why should, so why should the queer community and different members of the queer community accept that? You know, it's just like, uh, um, the racial tensions in our country. It's like the idea of telling people of color that they have enough when they still don't have fair, equal, um, treatment, uh, fair and equal privileges and fair and equal protections, you know, no, there's not a point where enough is going to be enough because we're still not at a point where everyone's treated the same in our world. So until every single human being in this entire world is getting the same rights, freedoms and protections as every other human being in this world, then no, enough will never be enough. <laughs> I love that. And I mean, speaking of to that same point, I mean, we're just now finally getting, you know, gay or lesbian Christmas movies or like holiday movies, you know, the first like Hallmark and stuff like that. And speaking of a, um, a holiday movie first, Happiest Season, you are in on Hulu with Miss Ben De La Creme. Now, how was it working on a Hulu movie? Well, um, it was just a dreamy, dreamy experience. It was just like kind of, it was one of those ideal acting experiences from start to finish. Um, Clea Duvall, who's been a friend of mine for a few, a handful of years now. Um, I was out to dinner with Clea and her partner, Mia, Clea and Mia. And, um, and, and Clea just tells me, so I'm going to be um, directing a movie that I wrote and I'd like to put you in the movie because I'm writing a role for you. And then we get on set and we were just, uh, there's no other way to explain it other than sometimes drag queens get offered parts and things and then you get there and you're kind of treated like the novelty act like you're not actually supposed to be there or that like um that uh you know you're just there to deliver a, a catchphrase and then please be on your way you know <laughs> and i'm really lucky that i've had a lot of ideal um experiences that don't fall under that category blue bloods was a great experience aj and the queen i was treated wonderfully um and then Happiest Season. They were so welcoming. Every member of the cast made um, Dela and I feel so um, welcomed into the family. And um, everyone was excited to have us there. And at no point did I feel like, oh, I'm like a part, uh, like a, a clown hired for a kid's birthday, which I have felt at some gigs. Um, every moment throughout that process, I felt like I, I'm, I'm an actor on a movie set. And this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you end up taking the little actor on a movie set a little bit further because out right now is the Jinx and Dela holiday special. Now I want to know how this came to be because I saw it the other night. I absolutely loved it. It was very like 1960s, 70s variety show special. I felt some Lucille Ball. I felt some Carol Burnett, Frank Sinatra vibes. So what can the viewers expect from your holiday special? I think what you can expect is a very entertaining movie um, starring two passionate performers and a cast of um, passionate dancers, actors, um, puppet artists, voiceover actors. Everyone who worked on this film did so because they were passionate about creating this film. The entire cast, the entire crew um, chose to do this at a difficult time because they felt passionately that it should happen and it should be put out into the world this year just in time for the holidays so you can expect a lot of passion a lot of comedy a lot of um just a lot of what you come to expect from drag queens there's full frontal um nudity don't worry it's not me uh, <laughs> there's full frontal nudity it's censored but still you know like we give you we give you what you come to expect from a drag show um there's fart jokes there's <laughs> it's funny to be a year and a half sober 
myself and still play a drunk, which I'm passionate. Uh, I'm passionate about that. I'm passionate about still playing a drunk, even though I'm no longer a drunk in my real life. So you expect you can expect all the things you want out of a drag queen Christmas show and then um, and then be ready for a lot of things you wouldn't expect. There's a lot of heart. There's a lot of truth. There's a lot of um, earnest moments of of reflection and and discovery. And um, you can expect to feel your heart warmed by two drag queens giving you a, a, a Christmas gift this year, no matter what you celebrate. <laughs> or if you're like me and all you do this time of year is, you know, um, light incense and chant to Hecate to finally destroy the patriarchy. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have a link down below where you can click and check it out. It's going to be on demand and you guys can watch it. Um as we're coming to a close, Jinx, what do you think the biggest misconception of Jinx is? <laughs> oh, I don't know. There's so many. Um, <laughs> do you know what? Um, I guess one thing that always surprises me is when um, when I see any kind of criticism that I seem like self-assured or smug or like I laugh at my own jokes because I think I'm so damn funny. Pretty much every characteristic it comes from a, a place of anxiety and self-deprecation. <laughs> like I love presenting as this fiercely confident, um, drunken, antiquated MILF from some other era, you know, sometimes it's 60s, sometimes it's 70s, sometimes it's 40s or 20s, never the 80s, though I hate the 80s. But anyway, <laughs> I present as this really self-assured, arrogant, um, self-obsessed person, because that's the exact opposite of who I am. Um, it, it, it's actually... Uh, one of those fake it till you make it moments. And I have a lot of fun playing this character and my audiences still seem to enjoy this character. So don't think that Jinx is going anywhere. She's just going to continue to evolve and adapt throughout the years. <laughs> and now she has a chance to, um, to be around much longer. Cause I quit drinking. <laughs> <laughs> Every birthday, everyone's like, so what are you most excited about for this birthday? And when I drank, I was like, I'm just excited that I'm still alive, honestly. <laughs> so you have the happiest season. You have your holiday special. Um, what else can we be expecting from Jinx? Is there anything else down the pipeline? I know that you said the Patreon. Um, what is next for Jinx? Yeah. Um, so I, I've got the Patreon. That's something you can... Um, that's something you can return to many, many, many times. Um, I also have multiple um, appearances throughout um, this season one of Hell of a Boss on um, YouTube. You can watch it for free on YouTube. Um, it's a really funny show. I, um, I got to voice act with a lot of amazing voice actors. I felt so legit in the studio that day. And everyone who works on the show is amazing. And even though I can't remember his name right now, the voice of Zim, um, I know his first name is Richard and then I can't remember the rest, but he voiced Invader Zim in the show Invader Zim. And he actually directed me in the studio that day um, that I, I, I recorded all my parts. And if my 13 year old self could know, could have known that one day I would be in a recording studio being directed by Invader Zim and doing my scene work opposite Invader Zim um, for a cartoon I'm voicing on, it would have blown my freaking mind. You know, <laughs> I'm glad I didn't know back then because I probably would have just coasted um, <laughs> and instead I've worked really hard throughout my life. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> And my last question for you, Jinx, is what is a message or words of wisdom that you have for our beautiful LGBTQ plus community? Oh, don't put me on the spot or anything. Um, I think my words of wisdom would be to be kind to yourself, to be gentle with yourself, because... 
no one could have seen this year coming. There was no real way to prepare for this year. So I just want to encourage people, as long as it's safe and responsible, you know, um, if it helps you get through this tough time, uh, allow yourself. You know, if that means you have to, like, set up different boundaries for yourself or if it means that you have to eat a little more ice cream than you normally do or you need a day to play video games, if it means, like, you need to be – you know, upfront and honest with people about what you have the capacity for right now. Like, give yourself the opportunity to take care of yourself right now. I think a lot of times, just people in our society think it's selfish or um, indulgent to consider their own well being when they make their daily decisions. You know, I think anything that is reminiscent of being selfish is so demonized that we oftentimes put ourselves last for fear of like, you know, not being the type of person we want to be. But, you know, it's one of those moments where it's like, you have to put your own oxygen mask on before you can put the oxygen mask of the person next to you. You know, like if you don't give yourself the tools and the opportunity to be your best self, um, how are you going to be, your best self for someone else. So, um, you know, we really, this is a time right now to, to give yourself every opportunity to take care of yourself so that you can go out into the world or don't go out into the world, digitally go out into the world (laughs) so that you can stay home and be the best person you can be for your loved ones and for the rest of the community. So, um, You know, have compassion, have empathy, have generosity, but don't forget to take care of yourself. Oh, great words. Well, thank you so much, Jinx, for being here with me today and exposing (laughs) yourself. Where can everybody find you on the socials? Okay, so I'm at Jinx Monsoon on basically everything except for Instagram. I'm um, the Jinx at the Jinx on Instagram because I didn't have an Instagram before Drag Race. And by the time I signed up, someone had already stolen my name. So um, if you know that person, if that person would like to come forward and give me my name. No. um, So I'm the Jinx on Instagram. I'm at Jinx Monsoon on everything else. And just to clarify, my name is spelt J-I-N-K-X because I had to be difficult. So um, when you're trying to find me, you have to use the K because I paid extra for it. (laughs) And you are on Cameo, right? I am on Cameo. Jinx Monsoon on that. Um, uh, Search uh, Patreon for my Patreon page. Um, What else? You know, Venmo, PayPal. (laughs) It's all Jinx Monsoon. So, um, Yeah, I really just like I have to send the biggest thanks out to um, the patrons of the arts right now, because uh, everyone's been affected by this. Uh, So many people have had their jobs affected by this. Um, There's no like saying any one type of person or any one community um, has been affected by this you know (laughs) maybe billionaires they haven't been affected by this fucking billionaires um so fuck billionaires and um you know i just want to thank everyone who's who's um been supporting artists at this time because you know it's it's really you know what do you do when you're a live entertainer and you can't entertain live and and the only reason i've been able to make it through and i've been able to make it through with a smile on my face is um because of the support and generosity and loyalty of my of my audiences so if you're watching audiences thank you so much (laughs) i'll keep doing my best for all those that are watching if you comment below your favorite part of the interview and if you're like and you subscribe to my channel I will be gifting one person a cameo from Jinx. So uh, courtesy of me, you may be getting a cameo from Jinx. So make sure that you put your favorite comment down below of what your favorite part of the interview was. Thank you again, Jinx. Jinx and the De La Holiday special is out now. The link's below. Also going to be linking to Jinx Patreon and all of the other goodies will be down below below. I'm Joseph Shepard, and that's the fabulous Jinx Monsoon. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph.